So welcome everyone to the inaugural edition of Hosting Art. I'm here today with Matt Clementi. Um, Matt is a fellow at the Center for Psychological Humanities and Ethics at Boston College. Um, and he also works with the Guestbook Project. I'm Diana Boros. I'm a professor at St. Mary's College of Maryland in the Department of Political Science. And I teach on both politics and public and social art and engagement. Um, so Matt, I'm excited to be here today talking with you about all these ideas that I love so much. Um, I'm so excited too to have met you because we've already had all these great conversations um, about art and guest book and, and how they relate and how they come together. And I remember that when the first, I think it was the first time we spoke, I was talking about how much I appreciated the existence of guest book and how I saw it as this socially engaged artwork. And I remember you were like, that's really interesting because I never really conceived of the project in that way. Um, and, and I was like, well, that's really interesting because that's immediately how I conceived of this project. <laughs> so, um, so I wonder how you, know, so how you came to guest book and what your experience with it has been like. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a philosopher. I did my PhD at BC. Uh, I finished back in 2019. And I wrote my dissertation under Richard Carney, who's one of the founders and co-directors of the Guestbook Project. And, um, you know, I'm so glad Richard obviously put us in touch. And I think that there's so much overlap between the work that you're doing and the work that obviously Guestbook does. And then some of the interesting things that the center is trying to reach out and broaden into. Um, when you first said that to me, I, it kind of had me rethinking how I conceive of the guest book project. You know, as a philosopher, I had a conversation with Richard. We did a like an interview dialogue not so long ago about Plato and whether to think about his philosophy as uh, kind of fiction, literary art, or is it philosophy and where the, the line is, the distinction. And the way that Richard framed it at the time was that uh, philosophy purports to tell the truth and art tells something as if it were true. The imaginative process is a part of it. And uh, I've been really kind of mulling over which of those two sides of the line the Guestbook Project um, straddles since we last spoke. And I think um, it straddles both sides. You know, on the one hand, so the Guestbook Project is about uh, the exchange of narratives, how to tell your story to another and also hear another's story as kind of a healing process, especially in war-torn areas, places where there's real conflict. And there's an element, obviously, of truth-telling that goes along with that. To tell your story, to share your story with another is to proclaim your truth. So there's that kind of philosophical element behind it, but I had never really thought of or, or fully appreciated the artistic side of imagining your way into someone else's story and how that imaginative and artistic process is essential to healing and to conflict resolution. So already in our kind of brief exchanges, you have me rethinking my own understanding of some of the work that I'm involved in. And, um, and of course, this brings some of the work of the Center uh, for Psychological Humanities and Ethics at Boston College right to the fore, because there's also the artistic and imaginative process in psychology of sharing your story with another, thinking your way through um, artistically someone else's perspective, or imaginatively kind of recreating your own narrative in relation to your therapist, your analyst, whatever. So our conversations have already been so fruitful around this very topic. Yeah, thank you. That's so interesting because now you have my mind going in so many other directions that I hadn't even planned for it. Because mentioning that about Plato, for example, I was just teaching Plato the other day, and that it, that's a very like valid way to think about his work. But I see, having been trained in political philosophy and working specifically in political philosophy, some time ago, I feel like I had to put aside trying to sort of you know, identify and label and locate where, how these philosophies, you know, are to be situated. Because to me, at the end of the day, what, I, what I've sort of discovered in my own work and my own practice is that it is about the effect of reading and contemplating that work. So I think there's a lot of philosophy that I teach, that I read, that I take very seriously as philosophy that others have called psychology or sociology mm -hmm. or art or literature, right? And 
to me, I mean, some of my favorite philosophers are, are, are genre bending, right? Whether it's Camus or Nietzsche, like, you know, people that, that do work that is definitely not sort of clear cut political philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. And and I find their work fascinating, both because I love to experience philosophy artistically. Like I love speaking of Camus and Nietzsche, I love to read work that that is artistic, that has rhythm to it, right? Where the writing itself is taking me places, not just the ideas proposed in the writing, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, and and which I think is very much, for example, with those two philosophers, their intention. Um, and so to me, I've always landed on, okay, if I'm going to be interested in the effect of whether it's a philosophy or an artwork or a psychological project, what are the effects that it's having? And I'm always seeking in my own work, political effects, right? Effects mm -hmm. that, um, that can affect the public sphere, the political sphere, and particularly in the direction of increasing justice, access, mm -hmm. inclusion, as you say, peace, healing, um, empathy, community, right? All these, all these things I would argue we are often lacking um, and lacking like attention to. Mm -hmm. right? And so, yeah, the the so to me, guest book is genre bending, right? It's one of these projects that, you know, when I came upon it, I was literally, I mean, I was like, wow, this is so cool because it's doing political work, blatantly political work. It's doing community-minded work, right? It's creating connection, empathy. It's doing the psychological work, like you said, the the you know the the discussion of pain and working through the pain through art for the purpose of healing. So it's doing all that work, and to me, it is it is what we might call a socially engaged um, artwork, which mm -hmm. is which in and of itself, right, is is genre bending. Um, and so that's what I would label it if I had to label it. And I'm not big on labels, Matt, but you know, if we were if we were gonna sort of talk about how guest book fits into the art world, um, I think it is as as socially engaged work. And just like super briefly about socially engaged work, um, because I think it's a term that is can be confusing and uh, is often sort of thrown around in different places and ways. And that's because I think it, it, there's so many different words that are essentially the same thing. So if you've ever heard of you know, socially engaged art, but social practice art, mm -hmm. um, new genre, public art, even just vague words like community art, civic art, those tend to be older, like from the 60s, 70s, um, dialogical art. Um, a lot of these, you know, these practices have been around since the 1960s, especially the 1970s. Uh, Joseph Boys with his social sculpture idea in the 1970s, I think is really sort of important to this. And then later in the 90s, Nicolas Bourriot, who does his work on relational aesthetics. And sort of all of this had long story short, over the last, I would say, 50 or so years, I think there's been this movement in art to A, take art outside into the public sphere and to B, um, create artworks where the key element of the work is the participation, is the interaction, is the collaboration, rather than the resulting artwork. So sometimes the resulting artwork is great and beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. For example, with the guest book project, maybe the the video created like is lovely and is wonderful and important all in of in, in and of itself, but that the real value is that people engaged in it, that they sat down and they did that and that they spoke to each other, they created the stories, they share the dialogues, that that's what's really, really important, right? Is having that experience. And so they're all works that, that focus on the experience. And I think it's exactly what Guestbook is doing. Now, I happen to think the results are awesome too. I mean, go look on the Guestbook website and you could get lost looking at all the different you know, projects that have been completed. But but just like, to me, the fact that it exists, that the forum is there, right? Mm -hmm. that it's like the foundation has been laid for all these conversations to be had. And that to me is like the artistic practice itself. Well, you know, we have so many touchstone thinkers in common. Once you start naming Nietzsche and Camus, you're already speaking kind of my love language. But I'm thinking as you're talking, you know, for Nietzsche, uh, politics is a major sphere of, of artistic creation for human beings. You know, the, the he calls um, the kind of founders of, of different societies, the artistic creators, you know, they're building worlds. And that's what politics is. It's the attempt of human beings to use this creative impulse to build something that doesn't yet exist, to imagine something new, 
and create something new out of that artistic impulse and drive. I was thinking while you were talking about how, you know, you're talking about kind of the process of co-creation between people as in some ways uh, the real life of the artistic process and the life of politics and, and the life of kind of social engagement. And I was thinking of Dostoevsky's notes from the underground where he's talking about how, you know, if you could build this perfect world and it was there, this crystal palace, he calls it, you know, once it was completed, people would smash it to the ground because at the end of the day, it's not really about for human beings trying to work through life and, and figure out how to live with one another and how to struggle through our problems and, and whatever in the world. It's not so much about the end goal, but it is about the process of creation. You know, he says, I think if I'm remembering it correctly, that uh, the whole joy of playing chess is in the playing of chess, right? It's the playing of the game. That's, that's the pleasure of it. And that when you complete the game, whether you want won or lost at the, at the end, it doesn't matter. It's, it's the actual process that matters. And so, um, yes, I, I mean, I think one of the things that, uh, has drawn our conversations so much fruitful, um, outcome from our conversations is the fact that, you know, the work that you're doing is drawing our attention to uh, something that we don't often recognize, which is that there there's a fundamentally artistic element to human social life. You know, all of our relationships are artistically grounded. We're creating them with one another. And when you become aware of that, you know, I think people, we're resistant to that because we think of art as something frivolous rather than something essential. But really, I mean, all of our uh, longings in life and all of our growth in life and, and especially the relationships that we're building and forging with others are works of art that we're working on together. And so to say that uh, isn't to diminish the value of, of politics. or It's to raise it, actually, raise the bar to a higher level. It's to say you know, this is something, there's a task that we have to work at together and we have to tap into our creative elements together and do this process together. And that's what I think um, I found so valuable about the discussions we've had. And like I said, that certainly helped me to reconceive some of the work I've done with guest book. And then, you know, because I'm, I'm a fellow in this Center for Psychological Humanities and Ethics, um, you know, a lot of the projects that I'm working on and things that I'm thinking about are how philosophy, theology, the humanities can help engage with and broaden psychological discourse, you know, make it kind of more humane, bring the humanities into contact with and, and into dialogue with um, with psychology and, and kind of draw psychology to a higher version of itself. And I think this artistic engagement is central for that as well. You know, I'm, I'm in analysis myself and so much of what I'm doing is co-creating with my analyst a, a new understanding, a new interpretation of my own life, my own relationships, my experiences, different traumatic things that have happened, different joys that I've had, right? There's an artistic element to it. I mean, when I'm in the room, there's a real work of art that's being kind of formed together. And so psychology intersects with this just as much. And um, and I think that we have a lot of overlap in our interests on these things. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm already now thinking we'll need part two um, of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, because now, I mean, your point about, I mean, so many points in there that were really, um, I think, really valuable. But in one of them certainly was your argument about sort of art being a practice that we're all doing regularly, sort of whether we recognize it or not. And the fact that I would argue that generally, unfortunately, society generally looks at art, as you say, as something frivolous, maybe as a hobby, something secondary, something you might do on a weekend, not as sort of an essential part of the human condition which is what I would argue, and speaking of Nietzsche, what Nietzsche would argue, right, that this yeah. is Camus, um, right, that this is something, this is part of, of who we are as human beings. And in that same way, it's interesting the way that you formulated that argument, because it's, it's, it's sort of exactly what I argue about politics as well, because in the same way, 
right? Generally, people think politics is not about them. Politics is over there. It's in yeah. DC. It's every four years when maybe I vote, maybe not, right? It's something that I don't have sort of much to do with. And I think that's a really um, alienating and um, problematic way to, and, and isolating. Speaking of psychological effects, I think it's why so many people, if they tell you why they don't vote or why they don't participate in politics, very, very often you will hear because I don't feel heard. It doesn't matter to me. It is not something I feel part of. I feel essentially alone, alienated, isolated, right, from the process. And so I'm always trying to sort of as a foundational assumption in all my work is not only what you just said about art, but sort of as a parallel that that politics is something we do every day, all the time, right? That mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. is is the interactions, is the conversations that we have every day with people it's the language that we choose to use it's the way that we approach people it's the choices that we make it's the how often we go into the public and what we do in the public and what we share and right that that's politics too that that's a really important part of politics right i mean gosh can you imagine reading aristotle's politics what aristotle would have thought about you know someone thinking they're politically active because they show up to vote for president every four mm -hmm. years right i mean the 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 whole aristotle's whole vision for example right was all about habit, right? His whole idea was that participation and public association was habitual. It was something that you exercise. It's like a regular practice. And, and so I, in general, I feel like we really, I would love to see expanded understandings of both art and politics as something that we all do all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't sort of, it doesn't take away from the fact that there's you know, politics in DC, and that there's art in museums, it does not, it does not take away from that. But rather, I would argue it significantly augments it and speaks like more authentically to who we are as humans, um, which I think sometimes society like actively tries to push us away from, mm -hmm. and the need for psychology and psychological understandings, you know, because I think there's just there's so much alienation and isolation that happens um, as part of the way that sort of society values things, um, which I think is often not attuned to like the human spirit. And therefore it's difficult sometimes to live, you know? Um, so, yeah. Well, I mean, piggybacking off of <clears throat> your point, um, and, and, and it's striking me as we're talking that there's this interesting relation between politics and art. Of course, you know, as I'm saying, Nietzsche would propose that politics is a form of art. Um, but What's interesting too is that we're implicated in both always. You know, there's no escaping either for us. No matter if I tell people I'm apolitical and I'm not, you know, I'm putting all of that to the side, it doesn't mean that I've actually escaped the web of politics because to be a human being means to live uh, a life that's constantly trying to negotiate and work through and resolve and figure out problems with others politics, you know, and, and the same thing with art. So, you know, um, I love teaching literature in my philosophy classes and I do so often because, you know, great works of literature reveal this in ways that you could say it philosophically, but if you, if you read a great work of literature, you see it, but there's an artistic element to all aspects of human life. You know, how we think about ourselves, the way we tell our story and, and, tell one another like oh I'm a, I'm a fellow at this place well what's that place and then I start explaining it I'm telling a story I'm making a narrative I'm creating something I'm creating an identity for myself and an understanding of myself but even like uh, I'm thinking the, through my day like if I go over the course of my day cooking dinner is is a very artistic thing right I'm, I'm incorporating aspects of myself in it just in the making of food for myself and my family and the way that I kind of bring in different elements or whatever. So these things, politics and art, and of course, food and dinner is political, right? Where do I get my food from? Who am I, how am I bartering for this or that? Or how am I situating myself in relation to other people who are making things that I can then use to feed my family or whatever else I'm doing? These things are so fundamental to human beings that we can't escape them. And yet, as you say, which is really the fascinating thing, we often think like, I'm not artistic, you know, someone else, someone else is, oh, that person's an artist, right? Like, that's not me. I'm not an artist. 
Uh, or we think, you know, as you say, you know, my political engagement is when I vote, or even if I think I'm really politically active, right? I go demonstrate, I go to demonstrations and I'm really engaged. But even thinking of those things as being really politically active and engaged is missing the fact that like, no, everything that I do as a human being in relation to other people implies a, a politics, right? And so, so much of these things are intersecting at kind of the core roots of what it is to be a human being. And yet we miss them. And in missing them, we then not only misunderstand ourselves, we, I think, to your point, also give up a lot of our kind of autonomy, ability to create ourselves, ability to imagine a better situation for ourselves, right? Like, if I think I, I have no say in politics, because that's in Washington, DC, and my daily life, it doesn't touch my daily life, then I lose sight of my own ability to affect my daily life and affect my relations with others. And the same thing with art. If I think I'm not artistic or I'm not creative, then what I do is I adopt other people's visions of my life. And I say, you know, this is, I fit into this category or, you know, I'm, this is my job or whatever. And, and I lose the ability to imagine myself otherwise or different or to imagine life differently. And so I think that's another reason why the work you're doing and the ideas you're kind of um, unpacking so essential because our real, there's a liberatory power uh, to art to imagining ourselves artistically and understanding ourselves artistically that once we lose that we forfeit a lot of our ability to change ourselves and change the world around us yeah yeah beautifully said i mean i think that i think a lot actually about you mentioned autonomy and liberty and i feel like so sort of two separate thoughts that that overlap i feel like um freedom is something in general that in the sort of American political culture is often something that people want to have, they are very attached to having, but they don't often think about or reflect upon using it. And really freedom is something to be used, right? Like freedom is, is, is action, freedom is relationships. Freedom, I would argue, is something that happens like between people and among people, not something you like hold in your hand in the middle of the woods by yourself. Do you know what I mean? And so like, I feel like there's a really interesting, um, something that we can think about politically, which is like how important it is to use our freedom and really important and simple accessible ways that we can use our freedom is to is as you said to go out and sort of think of ourselves more more broadly right to allow ourselves to imagine ourselves as political actors as art as artists as artistic actors and to sort of embrace that and allow that to exist and I think you know I think you're right in sort of everyday life and colloquial language and American political culture, these things are, are often really, there's, they're not discussed. I mean, quite frankly, I think we often lack even the language, like the vocabulary to talk about them effectively, like colloquially, right? Sort of outside of the academy, right? This is not something I would argue that it's just sort of part of our regular sort of cultural exchange. I think it's, it's, it's a shame. And I would go so far as to say that I think it's actually unhealthy, you know? So, I mean, I feel like having like you were saying, that ability to access your own political and artistic possibilities and like imaginative capabilities is empowering. And I think it's healthy. And I think it like can make one whole, right? Rather than than dis like separated and alienated and disoriented. And so I, I see these things as very healthy. And, and, you know, it's very evident, right? We have a slew of sociological and psychological studies that provide evidence for how sort of healthy art is, right? We have art therapy, we have art in hospitals, we have art in prisons, right? We have, we sort of are, we have this sort of knowledge base and even the data to support that art does good things for people, right? It does good things for society. It makes people feel good, often makes people feel happy, maybe empowered, all these things. So like we, we know that that, that exists and yet, generally there is not sort of widespread support for seeing art as integral either to society or to the human experience right it's still something that's like over there um and so i i think that's really important and valuable to to bring these two elements of the human experience into conversation meaning art and politics um but something else i thought of when you were speaking um earlier is that is really interesting to me about the center 
which is that it, it's like it's fun it's obviously fundamentally interdisciplinary right but it's also to that end like supportive of collaboration and i feel like to everything we've been talking about, um, collaboration is also a really, really important part of this, right? We collaborate, as you said, in politics, we collaborate in art, and the type of work that guest book does, like the type of project that it is, is inherently collaborative, right, at its very foundation. Um, and so I love that idea of sort of acknowledging that we need to sort of bring different elements, different disciplines, different approaches, methods, elements of thoughts, parts of the human experience together to ultimately sort of find the best solutions for what is a, you know, healthy, fruitful, free, liberating, um, holistic life. Um, and I, I think that's really, I think that's really cool, like about the center. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking as you're talking that, you know, another one of the focuses of the center, so it's the Center for Psychological Humanities and Ethics. Right. And, um, and and also obviously there's I mean people would tie ethics and politics together fundamentally right but I think ethics and art just as uh, are just as natural of a fit because again as you're saying there's this collaborative element to politics and art and and ethics is really about trying to understand what our responsibility is to other people and how we can live in community with other people and all of that. There's a political element to that, uh, and maybe also uh, on a on a personal level, like a, an individual level. There's obviously fundamentally an artistic element to that. Me having to imagine myself as another, me having to think my way into someone else's condition, and and try to understand that perspective and that dynamic. And so, I think that this is a fundamental connection between these various, you know ways of experiencing the world that human beings have and various kind of orientations in the world is that um, they all involve or necessitate this kind of imaginative process that that we're always kind of working through. And um, and so, yeah, I think that, you know, not to keep saying how much all of this stuff kind of fits hand in glove together, but it's amazing to find. And one of the things that's been so fruitful since the center's gotten up and running just in the past six months is to find uh, how how many people there are out there who are also wanting to see these things brought together and how many different organizations and groups uh, there are who are saying who are starting to tap into the idea that there's something here there's something essential about human life here and we need to be doing these things because as you say not only is it healthy and good for us but it's also about imagining uh, what's possible for tomorrow as well as what's good for us today yeah, I think that I, I appreciate that you brought up the idea of ethics here, right? In the very name of the of the center. But, you know, I don't know how, to, I wouldn't know how to work as a political philosopher and not have as sort of my central focus at the end of the day, beyond everything I've else I've said, you know, it should be, I would argue, should be the pursuit of justice. It should be for all of us, right? We should be trying to figure out how to, you know, make the world a more just place, a more equitable place, a more inclusive place, whether that's a physical place, a metaphorical place, a place created by laws and rights, or a place created by emotions and communities, all of those things, right? And so I feel like projects like Guestbook, and in general, socially engaged works, because by the way, they there is such a wide variety of socially engaged works and sort of those that would identify as social practice art. Um, and some of them, Matt, you know, if I feel like if I could show you a bunch of them, some of them would sort of maybe look as you might expect, like, okay, I can see that as an artwork, as like a public artwork. And some of them really don't. I mean, there are bike share programs, there's community gardens, there's, you know, boats put out on rivers in the middle of, uh, you know, in the middle of neighborhoods that serve various medical functions that are sort of mm -hmm. medical clinics where, you know, you look at them and you're really like, I mean, that's really sort of blatantly political, right? Or agricultural or medical, right? Um, and they're like actively providing services that, you know, that in some sense, the government or society is not providing, right? Mm -hmm. These artists are. Um, 
but what they're what they all have in common these we you know all of these sort of wide variety of projects is that they are attempting to take on directly issues challenges in the world social and political challenges and ethical challenges of course um in a way that they're doing it usually publicly um though there are sort of socially engaged works that are sort of housed inside like in galleries that focus on this type of work but most often they're in some sense public um, and they are asking sort of communities to engage with them. And the hope is with all of these projects that like if Matt, you and I were walking down the street and then we saw one of these projects, right? And we're like, oh, let's stop in and you know check it out. The hope is that by experiencing it, however we might feel and however long we would experience it for, right, we all have different experiences, that we would feel in some way moved by it, changed by it changed by like our own experience and seeing it maybe interacting with other people in it one person many 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 people right and that in sort of sharing something sharing this experience right um that we're sharing sort of willingly and publicly with others we are just a little bit as you said like learning about how others are and feel and 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 how what condition they exist in that is you know likely different from ours and you mentioned way earlier the word empathy but it's so i would argue it's so so essential to to justice like we so essential it's like everything i mean really we have to try to understand you know what others are going through and that's really hard in a place like america because we're super big right we're big you know, you know, population wise, land mass, we're huge. But all democratic theorists, everyone you ever read was like, we need a small homogenous place for democracy. Right? Well, we don't have that, right? We're diverse, we're big. And it's really hard, I think, for people to, to sort of recognize each other to see each other. And it's really easy to be like, well, you're over there, I don't see you, right? So these projects, I think, attempt to like, pull people in, and kind of force them to look at each other, force them to have these experiences. Um, some of them, by the way, some of my favorite ones, um, which remind me a lot of guest book, uh, actively ask people to share stories. So very much like guest book in different ways. Sometimes you share pictures or you share a moment or a story, you share music. There's so many different projects, but like in some way you're actively giving of yourself putting it into the public forum and letting other people see it and respond to it and react to it. And I tell you, there's been a couple projects that I've experienced um, where I was really, I was moved to tears. I mean, I felt really, really emotional. I shared of myself. It felt vulnerable. It felt intimate. I felt, I mean, really, I just felt completely like changed by it. I didn't want to leave the space. You know, I felt like it was just like this intimate space with people I did not know telling me things that are that you normally tell someone, you know, a loved one. And so I think guest book is, is similar. Um, it's not a physical, it doesn't have sort of a physical home in that way. You wouldn't come across it on a street corner. But when, you know, looking through the website, I had that same feeling where like, if I watch enough of these videos, I tears come to my eyes because you, you think about these stories and you, you know, it sounds cheesy to say it, but cheesy things are the best things in life, right? Um, but you think about, other people's stories and you think about what they're going through and there's really like not a lot of things that are more powerful than that I would argue you know yeah absolutely and I mean <clears throat> I think what what you say um it brought a couple of you know maybe smaller points to my mind but you know the first is that um in creating something artistically whether it's a, a what we would think of as a traditional work of art you know that you're sharing or creating a relationship with someone that creative process, you're entering into and being willing to enter into something that's very vulnerable, that makes you vulnerable, and that asks of other people that they be vulnerable as well, yeah. right? Because when you create something, it's always possible that it's going to be rejected. When you put something out there, it's always possible that it's going to be shut down or, or um, you know, that you're going to be, it's going to be misunderstood. People are going to take it the wrong way. They're not going to see what you're doing and they're not going to want to. So you make yourself vulnerable, but you ask of the person that you're either creating with or that you're creating for, you ask for a type of vulnerability as well, which is kind of the root uh, of a lot of these dynamics and relational things that we're talking about. The other thing that I was thinking, and this is a briefer point that's only, you know, half half formed in my mind, but um, I think it speaks to the nature of justice also, not again as something out there, but as something that's made between people. You know, mm -hmm. justice is something that we make together. 
and that we have to always work at and refine and refashion, right? Like nobody, this is one of the great things about reading the Platonic dialogues. Socrates is always saying again and again, like, do you know what justice is? <laughs> like, I don't know what it is. What is it? And part of the implication, I think, is that it's not something that you can discover, you know, somewhere out there, but it's something that we're constantly struggling to work together to figure out what it is and what it means and, and how to live it. And so there's a, a fundamentally creative process that's going on when we're talking about justice, which is, again, one of these things that we're not always aware of. We're not always aware that, like, we have a responsibility in relation to justice to make it a reality. It's not just a reality. It doesn't exist. It's not like, OK, now my responsibility is over because we've discovered justice and we've we've gotten to the goal of the cause and we have figured it out. It's like, no, this is something that as as all works of art do when an artist always talk about this demands you to constantly be working at it, rethinking it edit like I when I write edit it re edit it re edit it again you know keep working at it and and these things uh, be it politics or ethics or or justice or you know all of these things are things that demand constant working and reworking that kind of artistic process that that's never ending really which I think we can pull all this together, Matt. I think we're doing it because, <laughs> because I, I that idea of justice being something you make, right? And earlier I brought up the idea of freedom being something you do or you use, right? Going going back to the idea that we ideally, right? I, we as democratic citizens, ideally we should be sort of going into public spaces and associating. Quite simply, we should be talking to other people, sharing ideas, right? And if we're doing that, that is that process, right? That you were just talking about that editing and re-editing, like, yes, for justice, we need laws, we need policies. Yes, of course we do, right? We need those, those mechanisms through the political structure that protect our rights and liberties, absolutely. But at the end of the day, right? First of all, you can't legislate all elements of justice, right? Because so much of justice happens in those everyday practices and interactions um, between people. And the hope is, I think the hope of all socially engaged art, and I think the hope of projects like Guestbook, and maybe the hope of the center too, right, is that the more that we practice, the more that we do, the more that we collaborate and face each other and talk, the more that we're doing that justice and getting that result, little by little. And you're right, it's also not the thing, right, the the palace that we create in the end, right, that is the dream, Right. In, in democratic theory, it is also absolutely it's always about the process. It's about the doing. The hope is that we just get up and we do it every day, even though sometimes it's not pretty and sometimes it's not satisfying. And sometimes it doesn't go our way because, you know, democracy is messy and chaotic. Right. Um, but that we'll still just we'll get up and do it and we'll try again for all the joy that we do get from those from that process and from those collaborations and interactions and conversations. And going back to your point about vulnerability too, yeah, making art is vulnerable, it's risky. Shoot, going into the public and being political is vulnerable and risky. You don't know how it's gonna go. You don't know if that conversation is gonna be great or not great. But sometimes I worry that it's easier and easier in society today to just retreat from that to say, well, I'll just stay home and I'll do what's comfortable and convenient. And I'll watch that news channel that tells me the things I like. And I'll talk to the people that I can predict and control to some extent, right? And I won't do those things that are so necessary, I would argue, you know, broadly for the human condition, for art, for politics, for democracy, which is to sort of like get up every day and try, like you were saying, you know, to keep doing it. Yeah, and I, and I think when we when we don't get up and do it, what we do is not just forfeit our ability, as we were saying before, to imagine life differently, to do something new. Well, who are we forfeiting it to, right? We're forfeiting our politics, our art. Think about how much kind of popular media just keeps cycling through the same story over and over and over again. And, and, and there's this constant commentary about how there are no movies, there are no new movies anymore, right? Like it's the same story again and again. The more that we individually give up our ability to create things, to be inspired, the more we give up the possibility of inspiring others and, and making kind of new things. This is the last kind of thought I'm toying with here. And again, this might call for a whole new conversation. I don't know. Um, I have one of those but, too. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking about how all of this relates to beauty fundamentally. 
mm-hmm. that, you know, at the bottom of human life is this desire for beauty and that beauty can be manifested, not just in ways that we would typically think of it being manifested, right? Like you hear a beautiful song, you know, you go to the symphony or something, but the beauty can be manifested in small ways in, in everyday relationships, right? Like, so that, that the point of ethics and politics and these things is not necessarily just like that it's the morally right thing to do. It's the good thing to do, but also that, that it's the beautiful thing to do. That life is lived more beautifully when we actually attend to this kind of creative process and and invest ourselves in it and think about, you know, what's the responsibility I have here? And also, what's kind of the beautiful action that I can lean into and how beauty can relate to just everyday interactions in life? Yeah, I love that. I love that so much. Um, I was thinking of the Einstein quote that I'm about to butcher. But the one where he says, like, you can either view nothing as a miracle or everything as a miracle. Right. And it's that it's, it's that idea where like the beauty of the everyday, I think I would argue that also essential to human to human beings is the desire for beauty. I like that word. Maybe I'd also add like awe, like feeling in awe, like having wonder, you know, that that feeling that sort of sometimes almost indescribable feeling that makes you feel alive and makes you feel full, you know, and makes you just feel like at your core. a a human, you know, and and it's such a special feeling. And I think if we could recognize that more and you're, and we could see, like you're saying, the beauty and the awe and the wonder in so many sort of relatively minor, right? Everyday interactions and conversations. I think, you know, broadly speaking, we would be better off, but also I think we'd be happier and we'd feel more empowered and we'd feel like more empowered over the world that I think you're talking about the media. I think we are so often feel more and more disempowered, right? From mm-hmm. from what are, and the thought that I was having earlier when you were like, I have a thought that might take us to a whole new, uh, a whole new good dialogue. I had one too, and we cannot go down this rabbit hole right now <laughs> because we'll be here forever. But if we were to go down the rabbit hole of sort of late stage or advanced capitalism, whatever you want to call it, that's obviously also really relevant here because so much of socially engaged work is attempting to create works that go against the main values of late stage capitalism, which is Mm -hmm. efficiency, right? Usefulness, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it's attempting to say, and individualism and competition, that there are winners and losers. Rather, we, you know, to sort of go at it from the other side and say, no, well, let's talk about collaboration. Let's talk about community. Let's talk about empathy. Let's talk about all these things that are, you know, not valued by Mm -hmm. either the market economy or the culture that comes from it, right? The capitalist culture, which I would argue is very prevalent, especially in American political culture. Culture. Um, so again, a whole nother conversation. But I think when you talk, when you mentioned earlier, like, you're like, who are we ceding this over to? Well, I think mm. it is not a minor part of the conversation to talk about capitalization, you know, capitalism and corporatization and privatization and all those things, because it, I think it's only growing more significant. Well, and, and also beauty is useless, right? In yeah, some no, sense, yeah, right? Like it's yeah. the utility value of it you know, to bring it into those terms, you see the competition between or the, or the, um, you know, the rupture between beauty and utility, right? So if we're, if, if our goal and our task is to make things as efficient and useful as possible, Mm. I mean, useful things are ugly (laughs) and beautiful things aren't always useful, but, but, you know, we have this, we do have this running assumption that being useful, and this is obviously you're saying the culture is indebted to the kind of Um, economic society that we live in, the economic worldview, right? We have this assumption that uh, if something's not useful, then it has no value, right? But use is not the only form of value. And and beauty is an essential form of of value for human beings, right? Use is very good for robots, but beauty is essential for human beings. And so um, how do we kind of continue to work at awakening a desire for the beautiful that that counters that trend. You know, I was thinking about that Dostoevsky quote that, you know, is quoted everywhere all the time. And I don't even know where it comes from, so I shouldn't quote it, but where he says, uh, beauty will save the world. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that this is part of what he means, not, not some sort of grand yeah. salvific narrative, but just that little beautiful acts change how you live and how you experience life and how you think about yourself and others. And there's something salvific about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I will say to be someone who is actively working in art theory and in the political theory of art in the field of political science, I am constantly having to make the case that art is relevant, it is important, it is, you know, foundational, it is something that can create change and, and create, you know, um, an impact on society and on politics. And it's often, you know, it's, it's not an easy argument to make in so many different sort of situations that value, as you say, utility. And to me, uh, you know, the the really truly the most important things in life, right, are the things that are a hard to talk about, and that's why we have things like art and poetry and music, right? Because they're hard to even put your finger on, right? Like love, like oh, there's there's not enough words or musical notes in the world for for deep love, right? It's so it's just one of those things, and so things like love and art, and you say beauty and awe and wonder and all those things, they they don't have use besides all the usefulness in the world, right? Of making making us fulfilled, making us happy, making us empowered, all of these things, making us healthy, making us joyful. And I would argue that we need, the, I would go so far as to say that we need those things politically, not just spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, philosophically, but politically, that we actually require those things and we require attention to those things. And that they, that more of that and more valuing of that well, can quite simply can could can change the world, you know? little by little, experience by experience, interaction by interaction. You know. Yeah, big aspirations, but they have to start somewhere, right? They do. They do. I think they. I. I really also believe in change. Definitely, like the the absolute value of change happening in small moments um, and building up, because I ultimately think that's the sort of the most powerful kind of change is the kind that envelop slowly and going back to what you were saying earlier the kind that you edit and re-edit and edit and re-edit mm -hmm. right um not the kind that comes down from on high one time that's important too um but but ultimately i think that you know many many small changes happening over time are essential to political life and to political change absolutely i couldn't agree more this well this has been bad. wonderful <laughs> <laughs> jinx um, <laughs> this, yeah this has been really cool and there I you have left me thinking about other things and so I think you know we should probably do this again sometime absolutely maybe we can cap your project with a closing video after that all would be great the, after all the other ones I'd love to return to the conversation okay cool all right I love that all right thank you so much